Okay. All right. So I've got the contract up. I'm going to put a hard copy in your mailboxes up front um, for those that don't have it. But if you want to pull it up, it's the purchase agreement 335. Um, for those, I know we've got multiple people that are dual career or part-time. I like the term dual career because like, would you want to go to somebody who does anything part-time with your largest investment, right? So even more responsibility on you dual career people to know what you're doing because you're fighting against people that do know you have another job. And they're like, how can you still help me? So your time has to be much more focused on knowing what you, you need to do so that your time is efficient and effective, right? Um, so I want to go over some of that today. For the dual career, I am doing an evening class on Wednesday from 5.30 to 6.30. So for those that can't come in, I'm going to start doing those once a month again. I used to do them every month and people would say, we need something in the evening and I would schedule it and I would take time for my family and beyond and I'd have nobody show up. And I prepared all this material and sometimes one person would show up. So I really want you guys to take advantage of that evening class too if you need. And even if you're not dual career, you can still, if you need to get some more information, another great opportunity. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. And for you guys online, while I'm doing this, I may not see you in the chat if you have a question. So feel free to speak up and say, hold on. Okay. Um, we're going to go through this quickly. This is not a full contract class. There are contract classes in our YouTube channel that I really encourage you to go out there and look at. One of the biggest things you need to do is take a page a day and in a week you will have read this entire contract. It is so important, you guys, so many contracts I look over and I'm like, you check this box, how come? And they're like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my practice ones, I checked that box and I'm like, well, you practiced on a house that had lead-based paint needed, but this one isn't. Don't just check boxes just to check them, y'all. You've got to know what the paragraph in, boxes with line items, what things mean, okay? There are a couple things that I wanna go over. Um, number two, I need a volunteer to read number two, personal property. If I don't get volunteers, you'll be voluntold. I can Thank you. Oh, Jamia, we didn't get to introduce you. I'm sorry, hon. Introduce yourself. Okay. So, hey, everybody, my name is Jamia. Um, I've been with Keller Williams since um, September of 2021. Um, you know, I think this is a really great company if you want to invest in your business and take advantage of the training. I've been an agent. Uh, actually, to, today, ironically, will be my fourth year. Um, wow. I just renewed my license today. So, <laughs> but uh, since I've been with Keller Williams, I would say I got so much information, knowledge, and um, I feel more confident advancing in my career. Um, I'm working with buyers and sellers. Um, I got one under contract last month. I'm working with uh, a buyer and a seller this month. Um, so, you know, take advantage of the training. You know, Patrice is a really good, you know, coach. Take all her advice in, you know, don't wait to the last minute. <laughs> thank you Jamia all right go ahead thank you so much all right go ahead and read personal property included all right hold on I'm about to pull up the contract right now y'all dear <laughs> this is going to be on the new one correct I think it was revised in July 
Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'm about to pull it up right now. So it shows personal property included. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. So it shows included in the sale of the above real estate if located within said property at the time of signing this agreement, unless otherwise noted, are shades, plantation shutters, blinds, curtain, and drapery rods, screens, and uh, screen doors storm windows and doors, light fixtures, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, garbage disposal, range, oven, dishwasher, laundry tubs, attic fan, smoke and heat detectors, on all means, hopefully I said it right, <laughs> uh, electric, okay, electrical wiring connections for appliances, ceiling fans, garage door openers, and remotes, mailbox and post out building and sheds, gas, logs, fireplace inserts, and all other items attached to the real estate and being part, um, including all shrubbery and plantings on the property. Also included are the following items, which will, you know, show whatever else you want to add. Awesome. Thank you. All right, you guys, a lot of times on contracts, I'm seeing you guys handwrite in either in section 23 additional terms or even right in this paragraph, right under it, people are putting dishwasher, stove or oven to convey and it's already in here. So, what do you think that tells the list agent when you submit a contract where you're asking for things that should already convey? Read it or you didn't. Right. <laughs> Shaquana said it tells them either that you didn't read it or you're new. So the other thing with personal property that you need to be careful of with someone getting a loan is the mortgage company will not lend on personal property. So it's different when they say washer and dryer or refrigerator convey with the property, put that in additional terms. Um, you can put it up here, but I've seen more often uh, if they're a newer mortgage lender or a mortgage lender that is really strict about it, they'll say, if it's in number two, we're going to have to have you correct it. So just get in the habit of in number 23 additional terms is where you should put refrigerator or washer and dryer to convey. Okay. If it was in MLS that said they were going to convey, then I recommend you put as indicated in MLS washer, dryer, refrigerator to convey. Okay. If it's not stated in MLS, but you're just asking for it, then you just put refrigerator, washer, or dryer to convey. Okay. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. By law, homes must have a stove or an oven, unless it's like a foreclosure or unless they're saying it's as is because it's, you know, been dismantled or taken out. So in, in almost all cases, that range oven will have to convey, okay? Um, look at your addenda and make sure you're checking anything that applies, especially lead-based paint. You need to be checking the date on your, um, on your home in MLS. Sales subject to financing. One thing that you want to put here is if it's conventional or any of the loan types, the percentage of purchase price, the lender's letter should say, you know, that they're putting down 3% or 5% or 10%, whatever it is, and getting the loan for the rest. So that's where you'll get that percentage. Okay. Um, I want to go on to deposit. Okay, your deposit 
should be what percentage of your sales price? Nope. 1%. Yeah. 1%. So if you're putting in an offer for 250,000 for the sale price, your deposit should be a minimum of 2,500. Now, if you want to look a little stronger, maybe round up to three grand, make sure your client has that available and they understand that that gets applied to their loan, or I mean, their closing costs and all the money they need to bring to table. They don't lose it, okay? Here's one of the dates that I want you to be aware of because it's not just writing up the contract, but you have to be copious about knowing all the different date requirements within your contract. So here's one of them, right? Deposit shall be made in the amount of, and to be held by, the brokerage does not hold escrow. That's your closing company will do that. So you put who's gonna hold it and when it's gonna be turned in. Typical might be five days, but if you're competing or wanting to show that you're a serious buyer, you should do three days. I've even done it sometimes when I know they're gonna be on it. I'll even put it's to be turned in within one, one day. But you can only do that if you know for sure they're gonna be able to meet that requirement, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm gonna put contract, deadlines. And then we're going to put them in the order. So right here will be deposit or EMD. Now, I know somebody last week had to go pick up the, the check from the client or the client delivered it to them, but then they had to drive it across town to the closing company. Be careful doing that because if you were the one to forget, that's putting your client at risk. If your client says, there's no way I can get over there, can you help me? Then yes, it's good to get into that. It's also nice, right? If that's something value add to help your client. If you use Vesta, they have an app that allows your client to write that check at home and take a picture. So nobody has to drive anywhere. So that's, that's good to know. So again, deposit within escrow. If your client fails to deliver the EMD on time based on this contract, who could be at risk? You. Your license. So you need to stay on those people. And so that may be why. As an agent, you go, you know what? I'm gonna take it myself. But whenever I did that, I always made sure someone knew. I have a check in my purse. If I if I get hit by a bus, somebody needs to get that check. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, that's why like, I was a nervous wreck. I'm like, this will be my luck is, you know, I'll get hit by a bus and mm -hmm. mess up a deal. Um, so that's that's one of your dates, right? Um, settlement possession, number nine, shall be made in the offices of, again, that's where your buyer selects who they want to do their closing. And then you have two boxes, right? Who wants to read the first choice? Shaquana, Shaquana wants to read that. I'm like, what? <laughs> I guess a date, you make up a date. Okay. Right, so put <laughs> in the date, date and then what does it say after the, the year? Or a reasonable time thereafter, if the purchaser or seller is making uh, diligent efforts to satisfy and contingencies contained in the right. Date. So basically, we're going to put a date out there, and hopefully you have contacted the list mm -hmm. agent and asked them what works for your seller. Don't assume they want a quick close because if they need to find their next house or they're not due in Iowa for another 45 days, they may want it longer. 
So make sure you're talking to the agent about what time works for them, getting with your buyer. Does that work with you? I know you have to be out of the apartment, you know, whatever. Yeah, so find out before you just select a date. You want to be competitive, and you may not be the highest offer, but if you're the one that works with their timeline, that may that may work for your advantage. The second option for settlement possession. So the first one says, or a reasonable time thereafter, so long as both are working towards yeah. it. Now, you may be working towards it, but the other party might be getting frustrated, right? There could be all sorts of reasons why it's not gonna close on time, but that says reasonable time thereafter. So then you have who defines what's reasonable. The second option, who's gonna read that for me? <coughs> I can read it. Thank you so much. Um, date 2000 something and subject to seller's right to cure any title defects as set forth in paragraph 24B. If settlement does not occur within 10 days following such date, a party who is ready, willing and able to close under the terms of this agreement may terminate this agreement by written notice to the other party and subject to the provisions of paragraph eight, Purchaser's deposit shall be refunded in full to purchaser, and neither party shall have any further obligation hereunder. So, what does what does that sound like to you guys? That's a little different than the other one, than the first one. So, go ahead and say what, Shaquana. It's ten days, right? What else? Somebody sounded like they were getting ready to start something. Yeah, I was just going to say there's a time stamp on it. So it, it says 10 days, it has to be. Right. Yeah. Now, what you can do is if that 10 day comes and you're, the, you're representing the seller and the seller's like, no, we have got to move on. We've had more interest. If you know you have backup offers, right? If you have someone that was second line and they're still calling you to find out, hey, are you still on track? Then you may want to get out of one contract if, if you think and know you can get a better offer that'll close, right? The other thing is that you, they can continue. You have the option at 10 days for either party to go, all right, we're gonna hang in there. Or no, we've got to, we got to cut bait and go. So there are reasons to use either or, but you have to know the difference and what is in the best interest for your client, okay? And there are some agents who go, I typically have only selected box one. And then there are other agents who say, I only select box two so that at the 10 day mark, we have the option, but that could backfire if it's your client that's holding things up, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, either one allows you some flexibility. It's just, if you're the one holding things up and you've checked that second box, they could, they could cut. So um, you pick the second box, just have the 10 days and you both can hang in there. You have to do it. Do an addendum. Good, good point. Shaquana said, so if you did the second box and you're at 10 days and both parties are agreeing to continue, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Get an addendum. And in coaching, I'll tell people, okay, go ahead and get that right. And they're like, oh, we're good. They sent me an email. I'm like, get it in writing. It's not considered enforceable unless it's on contractual language in the addendum, okay? Um, Patrice, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So it says subject to seller's right to cure any title defect. So does that mean that the day has come, the 10 days has passed, but if the seller is still trying to cure title defects, does that waive the 10 days or what does that say? Um, well, let's read. Well, it says um, as set forth in paragraph 24B. So point is, 
checking things out. 24B, title. All right, so read that and see if that answers your question. Right, so I guess if you want a general, general warranty deed, but at the 10 days, you're still battling a special warranty deed, say, yeah. then, right. you have, then you can continue the, on past those 10 days. Is that one right. more? And this says, if the defect is not cured within 30 days, after they after the seller receives notice of the defect then either party may terminate at the expiration of the 30-day period by written the other party so yeah so um and that's why sometimes if you're um working with a seller that may be in a state or um someone's not sure of the clear chain of title. As a list agent, when I used to sell properties for banks, I always did a title search on the front end because I didn't want to surprise a week before closing because normally the title search comes in near the end. So if it's land, you might find out in a title search that someone titled three acres of the 20 to a niece or nephew and they built a home on it. So you don't have 20 acres, you have 17. So there may be, and, and title searches are not that expensive depending on where the location is and stuff. So sometimes that may be something you might wanna consider on the front end, okay? Um, oh, so me uh, the seller would. Oh, the seller would. Yeah. If the seller's willing to do that, um, if there's ever any question. You can also see in MLS, it will tell you what type of deed you'll get, whether you're getting a special warranty deed or like standard and things like that. So you can see that in MLS, okay? So that's the closing part. Now um, I wanna go to, Go to section 16 for the inspection. And there's so many different scenarios that we all know that you can go through an inspection. Waiving inspection, or I wanna concentrate on this second paragraph, okay? And this says, Seller hereby grants the purchaser the right to have the property inspected by a licensed home inspector or other person selected and to request a repair defects repealed. Purchaser, oh, this is saying purchasers requested repairs and seller paid closing costs are collectively referred to herein as the repair request. All right, I need somebody to read me the sentence that starts, um, inspections may include. Inspections may include, but are not limited to, all structural and building components and systems, radon ga gas, underground storage tank, soil condition, environmental testing, and engineering studies. This is key. And this was something that I pointed out when I was helping the agent this weekend over a repair request. The term defects as used in this paragraph 16 shall mean a condition which impairs normal stability, safety, or use of any improvements, which are the buildings of the property, damage to any part of the improvements, but shall exclude, y'all need to underline this, excludes cosmetic flaws, antiquated systems, or grandfathered components that are in working order, but would not comply with current building code if constructed or installed today. It even spells out, you guys, if a system or component is near or at beyond its projected life expectancy, but is properly functioning, then such a system or component would not be deemed 
as a defect. Okay, so it's for systems, structure, and safety. Okay, so when you get that repair report or that inspection report, it is going to include anything and everything. That inspector is going to highlight, you know, you might want to consider this. You might want to plan for that. Focus on just the things that are either red, like a, a, those are the ones that are truly safety or concern, big concerning items. And then there'll be some orange that are the, you know, this, this is kind of like borderline or maybe something you want to think about, right? Um, an example, though, of something that was on there that I used so that everybody can learn from this was if trees are trees and shrubs, right? When you go to list a house, you should cut back those things and make sure the bushes aren't overgrown up against the house and hidden windows and stuff like that. So this inspection showed that and said, you know, this is this affects moisture on the house and limbs over the roof can damage the roof and cause issues. Because of some of the other items that were in the inspection, like I don't think that's something that should be a major um, request because the price for that was four to five thousand dollars. They also recommended that any tree within 15 feet of the house be removed. So it was four to $5,000. Um, but what you can do is say, limb up any branches that are touching the home or things like that. Um, because what you don't want is to submit a repair request where they're ready to walk away because they think you're not gonna be reasonable. Either you or your client, right? So. Here's where you guys really need to know some dates. The second paragraph says, purchaser shall provide seller with all inspection reports, cost of repairs, and purchaser's written requests no later than blank days after ratification. And then what comes after that line? Two big letters that says, or, or a date and time, okay? So make sure that you're only doing one of those, either doing like seven days is more competitive, but you've got to look on the calendar and go, oh, I've got to get an inspection. I have to review it, review it with my buyer and come up with that repair, repair request by day seven. But if you know you're going to be committed out of town leading up to that, you know, just make sure you know your time frames, right? So, um, so yeah, so we're going to go over that. So you have to have the inspection. So you have to have it conducted. And usually you get the report maybe the next day, reviewed, and then the um, request created. Okay, so that's another date. Um, if if your if your buyer also wants like a radon test, or if they think something looks off and they want an additional inspector, that's all part of that that time frame. Okay. I need somebody to read me um, well, I'll just read it because it's mid mid paragraph. If the purchaser does not submit to seller all inspection reports, cost of repairs and the repair request by the inspection deadline, then the purchaser is thereby waiving the right to request any repairs or closing costs credit. Okay. Um, then the seller 
has to respond in writing to the repair request within seven days. I've had agents go, well, I sent the repair request and it's been two days. I'm like, well, you had seven to review it, right? So give them time to work through it, let the seller digest. It's important to make sure they received it, but then now they have seven days to respond. Okay. And then, yeah, a, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question on that part. So, um, yeah, I do see that it shows seven days on the seller's behalf, but what about the purchaser? Uh, like, for example, if you receive a counter offer on a repair request from the seller, does the purchaser also have seven days um, to negotiate? How about you go to page five? And read that second paragraph. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's probably what it was. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. On. You want so me to that, read it out loud? Yeah, go ahead for everybody. Okay, okay. Hold on. I'm about to pull up the contract right now. Y'all be with me. Okay, let me just go ahead for sake of time. If by oh, 5 okay. p.m. on the seventh day of negotiation, no final agreement is reached on the repair request, then the purchaser shall have until 5 p.m. on the second day after the end of negotiation, right? So now, buyer has two days to um, accept in writing the seller's last offer and proceed to settlement. If the purchaser terminates this agreement or fails to notify of its election within the said two day period, then this agreement shall terminate and is subject to the provisions of paragraph eight. Purchaser's deposit shall be refunded in full to purchaser. You guys, so many times you guys are going, well, if we can't come to agreement, what happens? You guys have got to read these contracts. You've got to know so that when you're sitting in front of your buyer and they're like, I don't know, you know, it, this inspection looks like a lot of stuff. Yes, it does. But we're going to work on that. We're going to negotiate for you. Here's where it says you can get out if y'all can't agree. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? You've got to know when you get under contract you need to start filling all these dates in your calendar. And what I do is I put it for the day before because you can't fix late. And if you miscount your days and miss your repair request, your buyer no longer has the right to ask for any of those. And the agents have told, will tell you that they have had to cover that themselves to make up for that. So don't, don't do that. And even if you're using a transaction coordinator, yes, that is part of their job to keep all that stuff on track. But sometimes I'm like, hey, where are we on the date? Because in my mind, I'm thinking we're pretty close. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, I just moved or I had, had an issue. And I'm like, so it is ultimately your responsibility. So make sure you're watching that. This optional paragraph that's in here is also very confusing. This doesn't have to do with dates, but since we're on the inspection part, this paragraph is or is not applicable. If no box is checked, then it is automatically not applicable. I think that you should get in the habit of still checking a box so that you're learning hey, I've got to make sure that this is in line with what my buyer wants. If no box is checked, then the paragraph is not applicable. If the paragraph is applicable and the purchaser is dissatisfied with their inspection results, then in lieu of submitting the repair request, they may then terminate. So if you get that inspection report and they go, nope, don't like it. It says that there's mold and there's 
structural and there's roof, I want out. That's when you should do that. However, most seller agents, if they see that, they're going to be like, nope, they're not willing to work with us. And that'll put you on the bottom of the pile. If you accidentally type that it is applicable, they might redline it when they counter. But to, to a lot of them, they're going to think it means that you guys are going to be ready to run at the first issue. The second box saying it's not applicable means you're going to request a repair addendum. Now, you might say, I want structure, mold, and roof fixed. Then it's up to them to say yay or nay. But you're negotiating. So if you're trying to be competitive in this market, it needs to be, is not applicable, okay? Now, one thing to keep in mind is if something is being sold as is, then there's, there's some different nuances with that, okay? Now I wanna keep moving to, um, oh, somebody coming in late. Oh, Lord, Lord is coming back. Um, okay, so then when we get to the date on the acceptance of the contract, number 21, acceptance, that's going to be your first date, right? Because you're filling that in and you're generally putting that pretty quickly after you put it in. You guys, do not put nine or 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night for an acceptance time frame. This is number 27. It's at the end of the contract, but it's your first day that you need to be aware of. So when you put in, it says this agreement becomes legally binding only upon two things. What are the two things that have to occur to make it ratified or to make it a binding agreement? Ratification and delivery. Ratification, which means all signatures and delivery. So they've got to get it back to you signed by the seller by that date and time. Now, sometimes they'll go, hey, the seller needs a little more time, will you extend your acceptance time, okay? So they have to sign and deliver it. Otherwise it expires, right? Don't make it nine, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. Do y'all wanna be up waiting until 11 to find out if you get it? And then having to call your client that late and let them know if they did or didn't get it? No, you guys have a life, right? Give it, give it some time. If you're putting in the offer, um, now in MLS, make sure you read the remarks because a lot of times when I'm reviewing the contracts too, um, agents might put this expires at 5 p.m. on Monday and they're getting it in in the morning. But when I read MLS, it says, we are reviewing offers at 5 p.m. Monday, allow for a decision until 11 o'clock Tuesday. And you're not even, people aren't reading that to get those things to align. Again, the agent doesn't wanna to have to call you and go, can you please change your acceptance date because we're not getting together until five o'clock. You guys gotta pay attention to details and you want that agent to think that you're going to be easy to work with and they're not going to have to follow up with you on everything, okay? So the dates that you have when you start out is the acceptance date, your deposit, EMD, date and time, your inspection, conducted, reviewed, and the request created and sent. And make sure you send the report, you guys. I've had people just send the repair request. But if you notice in here, it doesn't, it says you have to submit all reports because the reports also have the monetary value 
of what's expected or estimated. I had an agent, y'all, that didn't send the report. They just sent the repair request. And that can make them liable because they didn't have to honor um, that. And they didn't say it, which most agents will say, hey, thanks for the repair request. I didn't get the report. But the other agent sat back and let the time expire so that now their seller didn't have to do anything. So, and I'm not done yet. I got another bait I'm putting up there. So leave room. Um, so does that make sense? So you got to make sure you're following all of that. So send in uh, all of that and sent with the report. Um, then the seller has seven days to respond to that. And then if you haven't come to a conclusion, then the buyer still has two days to decide. Okay. Now, one thing you can do, say your inspection comes back and it says potential settlement structural issue. And you're like, whoa, that could be a big deal. But we don't know. You can then do an addendum to extend your repair request time frame if they agree. Call the other agent, hey. They said it could be potential settlement issue. This happened on my house. And it said, could be potential, not sure, not qualified. We're not going to, because the inspection company is then liable if it's a bigger problem. So they said, you might want to be warned, but we don't know. So call, call the other agent. Hey, it's saying possible structural we hope not, but they want to get a structural engineer out there. We need to extend the repair request time frame another three or four days. I've got somebody going out there, you know, and then you get it in writing in addendum. It doesn't count unless you get it in writing in an addendum. And then when we had them come out, while the other agent said, oh yeah, there was some issue, they had it repaired, Here's the invoice from a couple years ago. We went ahead and still paid. We, the buyer pays, had uh, a structural engineer come out, gave him the report. Well, didn't give him the report at first because he inspected and he said there was an issue, but they have taken care of it correctly. And then I presented the report because I didn't want to lead the witness, right? So then I gave the report and said, does this look like it represents what would have, and they said, yes, this, you know. So just know that you can extend it if you need for certain reasons to get more um, inspections. Okay, and then we've got closing date. There's another date that's really important that I want you guys to read. Uh, if you go back to, the financing, okay, number six, financing. It says, da, 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 da. I'm trying to pull it up for you guys online. Okay, number six, financing. Purchaser shall make a written application for the loan within seven days after the date of ratification. So you guys, when you have a pre-qualification letter, that's just a pre-qual. That's just them saying, based on what they told me, her income, her debt, I've pulled credit, looks like they're in this price point. But they have to physically or do the formal application. Okay. Most people do it as soon as they get their offer. You should be telling your client, hey, make sure you, you go down the path to get your loan going. But this is saying that they have seven days to do it after ratification, right? So if your buyer has been, uh, it's like pulling teeth, getting them to do everything, you're going to have to follow up on that. So read that paragraph so you understand that portion. 
Another thing that you can do to have a solid buyer, and this is so important, you guys, while you're waiting, get them to go from pre-qualification to a full pre-approval. How much stronger do you think your offer is when you go, this person's pre qual the agent knows, that is just a, a quick run of numbers. But to say they have been vetted and they have been pre-approved, they pulled all their financials, their credit, their um, employment. So in that, in the moment, waiting, go ahead and get fully pre-approved, okay? So keep them working on that. And then the other thing is the, um, so that they're they, waiting for, let's say again, they're waiting for what they're all. So like, just that. say they're like, okay, I'm pre qual And you're like, okay, there's nothing on the market in that area right now. We're going to wait. Um, I'm looking for a certain oh, okay. area. Okay. Well, while you're waiting, get with your lender on getting fully pre-approved. Okay. So when you go find something, you're already. Right. Or because if you lose one deal and you're like, yeah, you know, one thing that could help is if you get all your documentation to the lender and let's get you fully pre-approved. So some lenders will do what's called a commitment letter that says we are committed and we can give you a loan. So that is a much, much stronger way. And especially if you're working with first time buyers, that's where there's so much more risk that something's going to pop up. Oh, they didn't take into account child support they have to pay or, you know, whatever it is. So make sure that they know they're going to have to get the rest of their stuff in. I, again, I'd rather get a surprise at that point than when you're under contract. Um, the other thing is that... Um, the buyer has to request their, oh, here it is, under number five, appraisal, and then we're, then we're done. Um, number five, appraisal. Is or is not subject to an appraisal equaling the purchase price? That's a whole nother conversation. Um, I was working with somebody this weekend. Their buyer is putting down like 35%. Mm. So I said, well, you can make your offer stronger if that lender says, yeah, we're not gonna do an appraisal because they're putting so much down. Then you can waive appraisal and also have a stronger offer. Some people and some lenders may still wanna do it. Even if you're cash, ask your client. Some cash buyers still wanna know that, that the property appraises. In highlighted, it says, the appraisal shall be ordered within 15 days of the date of ratification. It is the responsibility of the purchaser to advise the lender of this requirement. I put that on my schedule. So that's usually going to fall like here. Now, it doesn't say that the appraisal has to be done by 15 days. It just says order, right? Most lenders want to wait till you've gotten through the repair request before they order an appraisal because it costs a lot of money and your buyer's having to pay for it. So they want to make sure you get through the inspection repair request and um, and then they'll do the appraisal. So they may order it at day 15, but order it four days out to allow you time to get through that, okay? The other is if you have a CIC, who remembers what that new term stands for? It just started in July. It's oh, the, the condo? Thing? It's, well, not just condo, it's the old HOA. Now it stands for common interest community. So if you have a common interest community and you get those docs, your buyer has three days to rescind their offer based on HOA docs. 
There may not be anything wrong with the docs, but if they saw a house that they are just to die for in love with, and they want to bail out on one contract, HOA docs is a way to do it. But here's the thing that's so important, y'all. That three days starts from when the agent sent it to you. If you're sitting on it and you don't see it for two days, mm -hmm. your buyer has one day. So I always ask agents, hey, will you please text me when you send that to me? And then make sure you get it sent to your buyer right away and that they know that they're on a strict timeline to back out. People who have boats or trailers or campers may find that they can't park those in the neighborhood. So then they have to decide if they want to proceed. Okay. So you got a lot of dates up here. I'll take a picture and send it to you guys online where we've been tracking these. I'll type it up, send it out. And then um, on Wednesday, if anybody wants to be on that evening class, I'd love to see you on that. Thank you guys for being here. Beverly, I know you're working on something. If you need more help with that today, let me know. I will. I will. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you. Have a great Thank you. Have Thank a you. Bye. Bye. Bye.